there is a great labyrinth ahead of us. When you set out on a journey, you never really know how it will turn out. You plan, organize, and set an end goal. But if it's a true journey, then the world and passing time will have its way and unforeseen change may occur. No plan ever really materializes in the way you wanted it to. It may turn out close, but more often than not, it ends up drastically different. Novelists must suffer terribly with this. Tolstoy once said that all great literature is one of two stories. A man goes on a journey, or a stranger comes to town. But on my journey, a stranger unexpectedly came to me with a key, and I opened a door and walked through. And I didn't realize at the time, but in doing that, I left something behind forever. That is change. You begin on one journey, something unexpected happens, which sets you on a new, altered course, and an entirely new journey begins. Change is a profound thing. It's only after the process that you look back and fail to recognize your former self. Who you were in the past is now a stranger to you in the future. And that's life, a series of moments, each one simultaneously erasing and rewriting the self. In the first league of our journey, I took us too high, too close to the light, and we were cast back down and crashed. A recount of my own fall from the heights of awakening. In the darkness you cannot see, but in the light you go blind. My initial presentation of our lost history consolidated, refined, and built slightly on the general alternative consensus in regard to our hidden history but it is rife with mistakes. I was still naive, bathed in false light. I overlooked the complexity surrounding the matter. This journey ends today forever. It cannot continue. I walked through a door and it closed firmly behind me. I can't get back to the old route I was on. What we have in front of us now is an entrance to something quite different. A great, sprawling labyrinth. A labyrinth that navigates a period of the Great Transition where the world underwent its own irreversible change from the Dark Ages to the modern world. It is a story of the Gothic, the labyrinth of the Lost Guild. As we are dealing with the lost or forbidden and destroyed history of our realm, it's easy to fall into logical fallacy and make sweeping generalizations. We just don't have the hard evidence that most arguments require for support. Dispelling the sorcery of the heliocentric model is easier. We have hard evidence. The heliocentric model is just that, a model, and it's supposed to reflect reality. But we have hard empirical evidence that directly contradicts this model. The Earth is stationary and no curvature is observed. This does not mean that the flat earth model is perfect, it's actually far from it. Any alternative model of our earth needs to do two things. One, challenge the dominant model. And this includes being powerful enough to wake up anyone indoctrinated by the dominant model. And two, reflect reality as realistically as possible. If I was to attach a quantitative percentage to the quality of the flat earth model in its ability to take on the heliocentric model, its challenge factor, then I would say it's at about 70%. The problem is that second category, ensuring the model aligns to reality as close as possible. The map and the movement of the sun and the luminaries are the remaining 30% that need serious work. No alternative model sufficiently represents the movement of the luminaries, while acknowledging the absence of curvature. At present, the azimuthal projection and as an extension Sturgios's wonderful moon model are the best we have in a general sense. The alternative Mercator-based models are underrated and fun, and there is a lot to learn from considering them, but they sit at around 35%. The movement of the sun almost works on these models, but ultimately they are weak as they need to incorporate an array of fantastical elements to capture the sun's movement and justify navigation and the sun's path as witnessed at the Arctic and Antarctic. 
And the problem is that these fantastical elements cannot be backed up with sufficient evidence, let alone hard evidence. They remain purely theoretical. Until these models can provide hard evidence of sun portals, space-time continuum loops, or alien technology, they remain very weak and on par with the heliocentric model in their requirement for us to put our faith in something we have never experienced or witnessed. The only difference is the Mercator models would not stand up in debate with the heliocentric model. They would lose and lose hard. Unlike cosmology, however, history is much more difficult, especially lost history. We are not trying to align a model and reality. The past is the past and it's gone. What we are primarily dealing with is narrative and narrative is a very powerful entity. And not only that, but we only have visual evidence dating back to around the 1840s. Anything could have happened before the 19th century. If I was to assign a percentage to our current consensus of alternative history and its ability to challenge the official narrative, I'd give it a rough 15%, based on the evidence collected so far in regard to the lies surrounding humanity's engineering and technological development. The problem with lost history is that our mode of investigation primarily consists of locating anomalies, connecting dots, and using our imaginations. And that's fine, even official historiography utilizes the tool of the imagination more often than it relies on hard evidence to flesh out certain eras. Lost time is precisely that, lost. The past is gone and cannot be fully resurrected. No historian can fully claim that they know what an era was actually like. They can connect archival dots and study the arts, social movements, politics, but they can never reclaim the thoughts, sentiments and memories of the people that actually populated these historical eras. And not only that, but archival material can be forged, duplicated, destroyed. I think it's fair to say that history is primarily characterized by absence. It is a story full of tremendous voids, and it requires the imagination to fill those voids, to make the absent present. And with this comes a tendency to fall into logical fallacy and hasty generalization. To demonstrate what I mean by generalization, here are a small handful, out of many, that currently plague our current line of thinking. The historical narrative surrounding mankind's technological and engineering advancement is a lie. Therefore, all of the historical narrative is a lie. Many structures show red brick under their facades. Therefore, all architecture was constructed in red brick. Many rock formations resemble melted buildings. Therefore, all mountains and land masses are melted buildings. The letter J appears in front of many dates. This means it was a millennial reign of Jesus. And the problem is, there exists a lot of counter evidence that can dispel these generalizations quite quickly. There is an abundance of archival material, especially from the last 500 years, that demonstrates that not all the historical narrative is false. There are many structures that are not facaded or made out of red brick, but other types of stone, such as sandstone. There are many rock formations that do not appear melted, but have deliberate formations like the basalt columns or various areas that suggest traces of grand scale mining. And if you get out and examine many of these structures, then you come to realize that there are many instances of J being used in dates that do clearly indicate it was a substitute for the number one. The reason it's important for us to refine and nuance our argument away from hasty generalization to a position that handles the complexity of the matter is because it can ultimately hurt us. And we have already shot ourselves in the foot. We have fallen into the trap of writing off the entire historical narrative due to obvious lies surrounding the history of humanity's engineering capabilities. What we have done instead is make claims that the entire narrative 
and all the characters that populate it are potentially fake. And this is bad. The boomerang will whistle back soon enough and hit us in the teeth. And don't misunderstand me, it's likely that a tremendous amount of it is fake. But if you enter a debate with a historian or professor of architecture and claim that all of history prior to the 19th century is a lie, they won't only win, but they will laugh in your face. The more hasty generalizations we make, the more stupid we end up looking. And don't get me wrong, I love a hasty generalization as much as the next fella. I'm not on my high horse here. In fact, I love it so much that I made the worst hasty generalization of them all. We see similar structures all over the world. Therefore, they belong to one whole unified civilization. That right there is not just a fallacy, not just a premature generalization, it's a sin. And I should have been called out for it from the start. I should have been ridiculed and put in my place. How could I have been so utterly stupid? And it matters so much. It was irresponsible. And now I feel a colossal responsibility. Firstly to you, viewer, my companion. And secondly to those of the past. And it's all my fault. After all, only fools rush in. But perhaps some will relate to my story. As I left the dark and entered the overwhelming light of awakening, I was blinded. The transition from dark to light is so abrupt, your eyes don't have time to adjust. It obscures one's reasoning. We pride ourselves on not being sheep, on not regurgitating the stories that indoctrinate so many minds of those amongst us. And yet we still have a tendency to do this, albeit in a different way, under the mindset of being awake. Never ever adopt the mindset that you have all the answers, especially when dealing with lost history. This is hubris, and the world will have its way eventually and make a fool of you. After I entered the light, I did just that, regurgitating claims that I'd heard elsewhere, and not retaining an objective, distant stance when investigating our history. And how many of us have done this, taken something at face value, and then gone on to echo this information elsewhere, and not test the information's validity, or apply critical thinking to its claims. And I've had to learn the hard way, my conscience is now a burden that nags at me throughout the night. We see similar structures all over the world. Therefore, they belong to one whole unified civilization. What a fool. Who the hell do I think I am? And you might want to say, it's fine. Come on now, don't be so hard on yourself. We all get it wrong sometimes. And that's true. But making a generalization like that is not without consequence. Really think about it. Who suffers from a statement like that? To illustrate my point, let me share with you an experience I had last year that gave me such agonizing cognitive dissonance. And this time it was different. My dissonance was not there trying to protect everything I had learned since childhood, but it was trying to protect my newly acquired light, my awakening. And it was on that day that I had a kind of reawakening, a challenge to the light that eventually led me down a path in search of clarity. I was on a road trip through Europe, and Great Britain was my last stop, so I prioritized the country's jewels. I wanted to photograph its cathedrals. It was the end of my trip and I only had time for one more stop. Did I pick York or Liverpool? I had wanted to see York for so long, to document its architecture, but for some reason unknown, I chose Liverpool instead. And I wasn't disappointed. In fact, I was stunned. Not only is Liverpool Cathedral England's largest cathedral, it's one of the strongest contenders for the country's greatest cathedral. I had never seen arches quite like this before. I felt completely dwarfed. The entire structure's gargantuan authority inspires, awes, and terrifies. 
My hands even started to sweat as I ventured up to the top of its tower. Although I stopped in amazement to see the 13 bells, the central bell, named Great George, weighs 14,000 kilograms. I spent my time snapping photographs here and there, proclaiming that this was glorious old world tech. That the quarried graveyard next door meant that it was a mud flooder. That it was a great impossibility. And as I entered the gift shop to see if they sold any photographic prints, a book caught my eye. The building of Liverpool Cathedral. Come on then, I thought. Let's have a good laugh. But when flicking through the pages, I came to learn that Liverpool Cathedral was actually constructed in the 20th century. It was one of the first real cathedrals to be built in England for 600 years. And the pages were full of photographs detailing its construction, brick by brick, stone by stone, arch by arch. There were images of masons at work. of the quarry where the stone was procured, of the steam technology at work, of the timber scaffolding. There were so many images and they are not fake. I started feeling uneasy, but I reached for my wallet and bought the book. I struggled for hours on the journey home. That little book from the gift shop haunted my mind. I couldn't find a way to justify the construction of this structure. Building a standard church is one thing, but a grand cathedral like this. I thought it an impossibility, but there it was, standing tall and telling its tale. Liverpool Cathedral was completed in 1978. Still, to this day there are Liverpudlians that remember its construction. I spoke to a couple of them while I was there. They are so proud of their accomplishment. And so they should be. What an achievement. I couldn't even claim that it was a cheap knockoff. Like I said, it's one of the greatest cathedrals in England. It doesn't just earn its place next to the great masterpiece cathedrals of the country, but it tells them to move over. I couldn't even say that it was a miniature replica. It's absolutely enormous. The biggest in the country. And as the construction photographs proved, giants did not have a hand in building it. Just fine Liverpudlians of normal human size. Imagine that, a grown man trying to find fault in something way beyond himself just to justify an argument he had made. Shameful. Dissonance tends to make you dizzy and recoil, and I did just that. My trip did not end with a bang, but a whimper. I even started becoming delusional, anything to suggest there was a lie present in the cathedral's story. Perhaps the cathedral was a front, and it was secretly working as technology, I said to myself, generating energy from the ether. Huh, there is nothing more ridiculous than watching a grown man battle with dissonance. But a couple of coffees later, I got over my dissonance and finally admitted it to myself. Liverpool Cathedral was evidently just that, a cathedral, a place for Christian worship, and it was the strong Liverpudlian spirit and talent that built this structure. The Liverpudlians had done something that hadn't been done in such a way in England for 600 years. They achieved the impossible. Imagine that. We see similar structures all over the world. Therefore, they belong to one whole unified civilization. Again, who suffers? The Liverpudlians certainly do. A people with such spirit and such a grand sense of identity. A people who should be celebrated for doing what most could never even imagine doing. Just because there is a lack of photographic evidence before 1840 does not mean a nation's people did not build these structures. And here's the crux, one of the most important questions I will ever ask you. Have you become accidentally complicit in an act that could potentially erase not only your own history, but also those of other nations? 
I did exactly that when I made one seemingly harmless stupid generalization. Have we looked into the history of these structures enough to make any kind of assertion that an entirely different people and society built them? Has your investigative pursuit become so stagnant, lazy and selective that you find yourself deliberately ignoring instances such as the construction of Liverpool Cathedral? Mine had. What a mistake. What a sin and an unnecessary one. Do not repeat my mistake and I need to write this wrong. I plan to demonstrate that these structures were not put up at the hands of some mythical one world unified civilization. It's so important not to be hasty and come to a generalized conclusion when looking into the origin of these structures. I really mean it. Let me try and put it another way to emphasize what I mean by this. We reject this, don't we? Why? Because of the potential for injury or even physical erasure as a result. But then we accept and promote something like this. Are we that blinded by the light that we cannot see how they are one and the same thing? One could potentially erase your physical being and the other, whether intentionally or not, has a potential to cause injury or even erase your history. It does not take much reading and digging to know that a claim like a one world civilization is not the answer. James W. Lee's book, The One World Tartarians, The Greatest Civilization to Be Erased from History, which can be viewed as a broad summary of the consensus I am referring to, is a powerhouse of reductive, simplistic generalization that dismisses and erases Europe's entire history in favor of a utopian lie, with little to no evidence to support its claims. Tartaria is not the answer. This is not the answer. No. In one of their many brilliant articles on stolen history, Dreamtime hits a nail on the head. In reality, Tartaria was simply a geographic area in Asia. It was part of the Old World, but it wasn't exclusively the Old World. To this date, not a single proof has been presented why this geographically limited region in Asia called Tartary was worldwide. I couldn't agree more. Tartaria's history as a nation and as a people is important and intertwined into the larger historical story of the Middle Ages, but it is not the sole answer. It does not even come close to doing the matter justice. Not only does repeating an argument like James Lee's make us look stupid, but drowning an entire nation's, let alone the entire world's history in Tartarian ink has a potential to be very damaging. The etymology of the word Tartaria is hell. I would like to hear Lee's justification as to why he thinks it's appropriate to try and rewrite European, Indian, Asian and African history as Tartarian or write our entire world history as globalist because that's what this type of approach is, globalist revisionism. And I naively promoted it and I have no justification for my actions, I made a mistake. And I know what you perhaps might say, it's more of a placeholder, just a word we use to describe these kind of structures. Perhaps, but that kind of reasoning is a half-baked argument at best. It is an attempt to cling on to an incorrect and potentially damaging argument and redesignate it as having some kind of worth or usefulness, which it does not. There is an abundance of empirical and written evidence testifying to the differences between Gothic and classical architecture. And this distinction is a basic architectural difference. There are many more differences between these magnificent structures. The use of a word like Tartarian as an adjective to describe these structures is completely wrong in every sense and cannot be justified via any argument. And not only is it wrong, it's nonsensical and weakens our position. Again, it makes us look stupid. Think about it. If you describe Liverpool Cathedral as Tartarian, you are effectively calling it Mongolian or Asian. 
Is it really the most suitable adjective? Is there enough evidence to call cathedrals like Durham, York Minster, and Salisbury Mongolian? And you might say, but the history surrounding Tartaria has been so suppressed, it had to be them. Well, by that logic, why stop at Tartaria? Many nations have suppressed histories, some much more so you could argue. Why not describe this style of architecture as Brazilian, Indian, or go even further and call it Parisian or Venetian? Describing something as Tartarian is just as useful as describing it as Irish. It tells us nothing unless it is actually Tartarian or Irish. And what does it do instead? It displaces the actual heritage of the people who did actually have a hand in constructing these structures. Liverpool Cathedral is not Mongolian. It was built by Liverpudlians, just as Notre Dame was built by the French and Cologne Cathedral was built by extremely talented Germans. I cannot emphasize it enough. This kind of hasty generalization and linguistic suggestiveness of a unified civilization has a potential to be so damaging. In our current time, words like Tartarian should not be tolerated. And yet it's strange, isn't it, that during such a time that this word could become so prevalent. Now more than ever, it is vital to stand up for our nation's history and to exercise high caution when it comes to accepting any hasty generalization. I made a grave mistake and take full responsibility and which from now on will attempt to rectify. Back to Liverpool Cathedral. Once I had gotten over myself, I realized that I actually felt quite chuffed. Liverpool Cathedral was hard evidence of the amount of labor, planning, engineering, and industrial capability it takes to build one of these giants. It took the Liverpudlian 74 years to build, and that's post-industrial revolution. So the historical narrative surrounding the construction of so many structures of the past was most certainly very questionable. It took our ancestors in the Middle Ages a mere 7 to 10 years to completely rebuild Canterbury Cathedral. And I could now see the problem in front of me. I had presented a bad, lazy and hyper simplistic argument that could be debunked very easily and failed to do the subject any kind of justice. I spoke about the old world as if there were not centuries between some of these structures. A tremendous amount can change in a century, even in quarter of a century. See for yourself. I spoke about these structures as if there were not very evident stylistic differences between them. There are so many differences, the Gothic and the Classical are just two of many. I spoke about a reset as if there was just one. I spoke about the mud as if it was just one isolated incident or cataclysm. In making hasty generalizations, I had set myself up for defeat. Our alternative historical model or approach is very weak and offers no real challenge to the official story. Let's take a moment to review the pros and cons of the alternative consensus. Let's call it the awakened narrative. Its greatest merit is its ability to seize the attention of the recipient and wake them up to the possibility of historical fabrication. Which leads to its second merit, it instills in the recipient a new or renewed vigor and passionate interest in architecture and history. Suddenly a whole new world of inquiry opens up to the recipient with childlike wonder. Both of those pros are very powerful, but it's about as far as they go. Its cons, however, are plenty. It takes hundreds, if not thousands of years worth of history and reduces it to generalization. It ignores the majority of the historical narrative in favor of the imagination. It tends to rewrite lost history in black and white terms. It's either or, good or bad, this or that. It tends to favor globalist revisionism and accidentally ignores or erases huge national groups from its vision. And finally, its worst attribute, it is wrong. 
and there is no change in that. And despite this, and the initial anger I felt as I moved towards clarity, I am forever grateful to the awakened narrative. It really is a perfect tool to kickstart further inquiry and investigation, and I would not be who I am today without it. And it is worth never forgetting that the awakened narrative is nothing but a tool, not the be and end all. And I now knew what I needed to do. I needed to strengthen and nuance my argument and approach, and do something I should have done a long time ago. And that's when I remembered Victor Hugo. It was time to revisit one of my favourite writers, and time to revisit his story more generally, and study it properly. I knew cathedrals, yes, but I did not know their story. I did not know the story of Gothic architecture at all, and I wanted to investigate further, to use the key Hugo gave me to try and get a better understanding of things. I wanted to know why there was an agenda to eradicate, erase, and rewrite the Gothic, why the Dark Ages were surrounded in foggy obscurity, what was being covered up here. And I wanted to know once and for all, did architecture once hold a lost function that has been hidden from us? Did the cathedrals hold a mystery? Yes, they built Liverpool Cathedral in the 20th century, but that doesn't mean the cathedral, as a form, in and of itself, does not have a long lost function. So I got to work, and I was pleased to discover that the historical narrative is, indeed, fraught with problematic anomalies and that architecture does play a central role in all of this. But the task I had in front of me now was daunting to say the least. What I had to do was reset my own mind, to take it back to a blank slate, a tabula rasa, and try and read the architecture, to listen to what its stone was trying to tell me. It's one of the most difficult things I've tried to do, to have both the official historical narrative and the awakened narrative somewhere in my head, while also trying to forget both for long enough to try and work out what the stone was saying. And to listen to the stone honestly, and not try and make it work with a narrative or theory that I'd like it to work with. Narrative or storytelling is so powerful in its ability to be convincing and authoritative. This is why history is very susceptible to corruption and falsification. Hugo is not off when he says that the printed word killed the building. It killed much more than that. But even understanding this, I was left with a big paradoxical problem. I still had to turn to narrative to try and tell gothic architecture's story. I still had to use my imagination to make the vast amount of absences present. I still had to tell a story that will ultimately end up being just that. Another story. A difficult fact to face is that because so much of our history has been buried and destroyed, because so much has been fabricated, because there are so many absences and there aren't people alive anymore to testify to the truths of the past, we will never be able to tell its story in a way that is accurate. It's impossible. The past is gone forever, lost. Unless there are accounts locked in vaults somewhere under tight key. But then how will we ever get our hands on them? And say if they were released as part of some kind of disclosure or even by accident, how can we trust that they are legitimate? We can't. The search for truth in the great annals of history becomes a search for the Holy Grail. It's one of the most frustrating activities you can engage in. It seems like every time you make some kind of progress and turn a corner, you end up meeting a dead end. More often than not, you want to give up. But it becomes a kind of addiction, especially hunting for keys. The whole process really fills the individual with a Beckettian sense of the absurd. I can't go on. I'll go on. And the real problem is the holy grail. The truth. Every time you think you have it cornered, it hops delicately out of the way and disappears into the night like a woodland doe. If you are waiting for someone to appear in this godless cyberland and give you the truth, then you really will be waiting for Godot. I do not have the truth. All I can do is try to dispel the lies, hold a critical light to some information, and try to piece a few things together. 
any and all retellings of history will be part fictional and part factual. In realising this, I was able to recalibrate what I wanted out of my investigation. It really depends on what you are searching for. For me, I want to get as close to understanding this riddle without deluding myself or relying on elements that I cannot evidence. I want the story I try and tell to stand up as a piece of alternative historiography without too much generalisation or fallacy, which is very difficult to do. I'd be lying if I said that we will not need to rely on the imagination to make so many historical absences present, but this time I will ensure I very clearly signpost what is theory and lacking evidence, when a claim has evidence to support it but requires development, and when we have sufficient evidence. But, and most importantly, I want my investigation to be a challenge to the official story. The Flat Earth model challenges and pressurises the heliocentric model tremendously. That's why many used to earn their little context boxes. But the awakened narrative that deals with alternative history never got any of these, did it? Nothing that comes out of this community within this line of thinking gets suppressed, does it? And why? because the approach is weak and cannot take on his story, the official story. It provides no challenge or pressure, and that's because we have fallen into the trap of hasty generalisation. Think about it logically, if we generalise that all history before the 19th century is fake, then we are left with a big, open space of time with no individual characters in it. And, as all stories need characters, when we do try to introduce one, let's say someone like Charlemagne, all the opposition has to do is highlight that we are cherry picking. So all our narrative is fake, but you believe Charlemagne, a character within our narrative, existed and was real. If we completely ignore the official narrative and go our own way, we lose. Because of the weak argument I presented in Volume 1, and due to the fallacious approach to this subject matter more generally, it now means we are carrying a lot of baggage that we need to drop. Let's free ourselves of some of this right now. This is a US Capitol building. It was completed in 1863. This is the Canadian Parliament in Ottawa. It was constructed between 1859 to 1866. This is Tower Bridge in London. It was constructed between 1886 to 1894. This is the administration building of the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Construction started in 1892. This is the Virenweed Dam in Wales. It was constructed between 1881 to 1890. Here are photographs of the US Capitol building being built. Another Canadian Parliament. Here are ones of Tower Bridge. And the Administration Building. And finally, the Welsh Dam. These are a problem, much like Liverpool Cathedral. You almost don't want to look at them, do you? And why? Because they are visual evidence of citizens of the 19th century building glorious structures. Many, including myself at some point in time, have made claims that the vast amount of 19th century and even 20th century construction photographs are photoshopped and fake. And to be honest, given the amount of deception we are subjected to, a claim like this is not that absurd. But can anyone provide hard evidence to support the claim? 
Can we demonstrate properly that these images are indeed fake or have been photoshopped like some have claimed? I don't think we can and that's problematic. It means our argument is weak. Can we make a case for them being staged photographs? That there are big visual omissions and absences in regard to the means in which these structures were actually constructed and how the materials for their construction were procured and prepared? Perhaps. But it requires in-depth engagement with the official narrative, dismissing all photographic evidence as fake or photoshopped and arguing that these structures were already here is cherry picking evidence to support a fallacious premature generalization. We can do better and as I will attempt to show, there is a lot of evidence that many of these structures were indeed put up in the 19th century as the final act of the rewriting and erasing of the medieval era. If there is one thing I have learned during my journey from light to clarity is that the dating attached to the construction of many structures post 1100s is generally correct. All you have to do is read the stone itself and you'll learn this, the stone is not lying. As I said before, due to the nature of the type of lies we are dealing with, primarily suppressed and lost historical narrative, there is a tendency to make hasty generalizations, but there is also a tendency to turn to the fantastical. To stumble across illustrations such as these and immediately conclude that wow, they have flying cities and go on to perpetuate claims that yes, those of the old world had flying cities makes us sound ridiculous. This Alan Lee edition is full of illustrations. There are many illustrative editions of fiction. Does this qualify as sufficient evidence to support a claim that Mordor exists somewhere in our realm, perhaps beyond the North Pole? What would someone in 200 years think if they found an image like this without any context? Wow, they had flying brooms and that there were once human babies that lived solely in the water. I don't think so. These are nothing more than illustrations of the imaginative genre. If we are making claims that those in our history have flying cities, then we must provide sufficient evidence and this means demonstrating that a huge structure, such as a cathedral, can tear away from its foundations and levitate in the air. It's absurd and it applies to all kinds of these claims. If we are arguing that these arches and these spaces inside of cathedrals are teleportation and time traveling zones, then we must provide sufficient evidence, not only of these work in this way, but also of time travel more generally. None of us have experienced this type of phenomena. We've only seen it in Hollywood movies and read about it in science fiction. If we are making claims that the people who built these structures came from other lands, then we must provide sufficient evidence of other lands. And as far as I'm aware, all we have is a partial suggestion of other lands in the image of the moon. And while all these claims sound marvelous and they might offer some temporary escapism, they ultimately belong to the fantastical and should not be incorporated into any serious inquiry or argument we want to make in terms of fabricated history, otherwise we will become a laughing stock. And again, I'm not on my high horse, I have previously made and indulged in some big claims, which brings us to the next example. Up until now I have made claims that many of the old and magnificent structures we find across our realm were originally created to serve the function of energy generation, that they held a technological role in the production of energy. The theoretical model I presented built slightly on the work of my favourite enigmatic Russian James W. Lee, John Levy, Martin Leidke, Marcio Ramelho and others. But up until now, it is nothing more than a theoretical model based primarily on resemblance and smaller isolated connections. Many aspects of these structures, their geometry and form resemble patterns of electromagnetic energy. And there are instances, primarily linguistic, that hint at a connection between architecture and energy production. 
It is now time, however, to try and evidence this claim, otherwise the argument will be classified as pareidolia, the tendency for perception to impose a meaningful interpretation on a nebulous stimulus, usually visual, so that one sees an object, pattern or meaning where there is none. And I made a terrible mistake. If I was playing chess with the official narrative, I sacrificed my queen a few moves into the game. I reiterated an argument that others before me made, that ether played a primary role in the relationship between architecture and energy without a single piece of sufficient evidence to back it up. How could I have been so stupid? I had spent so many hours debating with the heliocentric supporters in my life about the shape of the earth and my arguments would always come back to the requirement for them to provide sufficient evidence and demonstration of curvature, of gravity acting on water in such a way. And they never could, but I could demonstrate through many means a complete absence of curvature. And yet I go and rush in and talk about ether as if I had just activated Salisbury Cathedral's spire. Silly lad, you lost your queen before the game had really begun. The concept of ether is about as elusive and problematic as the concept of gravity. And I'm not saying ether doesn't exist and civilizations in our history did not understand or harness it. On the contrary, I believe it does exist, but believing is not evidencing. I would have done much better to lead with something like plasma. But even then, I still cannot provide sufficient evidence of any piece of architecture working with plasma. In fact, there is a lot of evidence against this. Ether is problematic, and instead of offering us more roots into understanding architecture's potentially lost history, it actually closes a big door firmly in our face. Can anyone provide evidence of the ether and its connection to architecture? They cannot. I cannot. It is a theory. And because of this, we do run the risk of ether becoming the new gravity, the new lazy justification, the get out of jail free card. And my story should be a lesson for all. Never repeat a theory unless you can stand behind it with sufficient evidence. Ether is just one theoretical way of approaching these structures. But if we cannot evidence it, and continue to argue for it, then what happens? Then our argument remains weak and we lose. Now what I will say is this, the concept of ether does play a role in the story of the Gothic and the Middle Ages, and we cannot dismiss it as complete baggage just yet. However, I cannot provide sufficient evidence of architecture harnessing it, no one can. And why is that? Because perhaps it is not correct. This means that the ethereal connection between architecture and energy remains an unproven theory. It is also too vague a concept to work with in evidence in a connection between architecture and energy. The evidence on this matter needs to be more tangible than a concept such as ether. The ether architecture theory has become a wild fantastical claim of which I have contributed toward. And as it's now hindering our progress, I will be dropping this theory right here and pursuing different routes into investigating the potential hidden mysteries of architecture. Oh dear, I can already see you sharpening your pitchfork. But before you impale me and throw me to the wolves, know this. My journey through the labyrinth of the Lost Guild was not just driven by a desire to understand Gothic architecture's story. It was also driven by my need to try and find evidence that architecture had a lost hidden history and function. I so desperately wanted to find evidence that went beyond pareidolia, that this looks like a coil, so it must have been a coil. I wanted more than the photographs of the illuminated world's fairs and amusement parks. These photographs are still not enough evidence of architecture playing an active role in energy production. What are we witnessing in these photographs? Is the architecture actively involved in producing the energy or is it just a space to hold the lights? Much like our own homes are a space that supports our own little electrical grid. 
Was mercury vapor powering the illumination? Was it radium or a behind the scenes steam powered Tesla coil? The same with the fireplaces. Is the actual architecture involved in whatever energy is being emitted or is it these strange little objects? Again, is it mercury, radium, something else? Whatever it was, these images are evidence that we have been lied to about the development of electromagnetic energy and alternative means of producing it. They do not, however, suffice as proof of a hidden connection between energy and architecture itself. It is more realistic that the structures we see here in the illuminated world's fairs actually played more of a passive role much like contemporary illuminations we see in our cities and fairs. The lie here is the means in which the electricity was produced, not the connection between architecture and energy. And even if there were some clues here, most of the world's fairs took place during the second half of the 19th century. These photographs have nothing to do with cathedrals or the Gothic. The Middle Ages ended in the 1400s. A lot can change in just a century, let alone 400 years. And the whole thing almost got to me too much. The official narrative is very powerful and I almost succumbed. I almost packed in the whole inquiry into our lost history and was ready to admit defeat. That I could not play this game of chess, my opponent was far too smart and cunning that all the clues that would yield just enough evidence had been successfully buried and destroyed, that we could not get any further in understanding our lost history, and all we were left with is pure imaginative theories, that perhaps there was no great cover-ups. And much of this frustration stemmed from having a theoretical concept like ether in my mind. If you give yourself over entirely to a theory, then you lose all flexibility and go blind. And it's not a good position to be in. What if there are other things clearly hidden in plain sight, and you cannot see them because your mind is too attached to a theory? What if there are other approaches and paths to take when trying to investigate architecture's potential hidden history? Hugo outlined one, didn't he? The architecture functioned like a language before the Renaissance. Has anyone tried to investigate this further? Are there other functions we have missed? Once I dropped the theory of ether, I began to see a little more clearly. The fog in front of my eyes began to dissipate. And as I collected more keys, I came to realize something. And it was not what I was expecting, something a little different, but it's paved a path for me to develop a theory, still in its infancy, but which I have sufficient supporting evidence that grows with each passing week. And the strangest thing of all is that I'd always suspected, I just forgot in my delusional obsession with ether. The best thing you can do is start applying heightened scrutiny to all information. If someone presents a theory, then it needs to be evaluated properly. Does it generalize too much? Does it make excuses and ignore counter arguments or evidence? Does it rely on fantastical claims without much factual or demonstrable evidence? And remember, resemblance does not count as primary evidence. It can only support evidence in a supplemental way. It may look like a magnet or a portal, but that does not mean it was one or ever acted like one. These claims need evidence, otherwise they are pareidolia. I think it's time to saddle up. The great labyrinth awaits us. Pardon, what's beyond the labyrinth? <laughs> Always looking ahead. I don't even know if we'll make it through this one yet. But if we do, then beyond lies the forest of Atlas. We're going back into the woods to tackle the model of our realm and try to increase this percentage, its challenge factor. We're not done with this or this yet. But let's stay in the now. We have a lot to cover, a lot of keys to find. I hope you realize why I am drawing a line in the sand. Why it's impossible for me to continue on the route I have planned. I've changed. I'm forever grateful to the awakened narrative. It changed my life. I just can't continue with it. But I will refer to it frequently as a point of engagement. Not everything in it is a complete dead end. The story of my awakening is one of Blakeian change. From innocence or naivety to experience or maturity, from dark to light 
and then from light to clarity, from being non-aware to finally being aware. If you do decide to come along with me through this labyrinth, then just a word of caution. I will, at times, challenge the light in a way that may cause cognitive dissonance, and eventually we will come to a fork in the road that requires a choice. You can either stay in the light, which means you have traded one light, the dark, for another, or you can move toward clarity, and with that brings more responsibility. I chose to pursue clarity the day I left Liverpool Cathedral. The Labyrinth of the Lost Guild My Araya to the Gothic, to Europe, and to the United Kingdom in particular. In the darkness you cannot see, but in the light you go blind. Stand up for your nation's history. It really is time to make hidden history great again. I don't have the power to stop this lie, this dire misstep. Only you can do that by rejecting it as both a theory and an adjective. And now time's up and the winds of change are whirling. A metamorphosis is occurring and it's taken us back to the Middle Ages, an age unknowingly braced for its own inevitable transition or because a king walked onto the world stage and set in motion a chain of events that brought about irreversible change. I think a reintroduction is necessary. Let's go.